Turkey and Russia have had a hot cold relationship in recent decades, with a long history of war going back to the late 18th century. Destiny has seemingly put the Turkish and Russian civilizations on a collision course, with the Turks and their allies having been the main obstacle standing between the Russians and their 300 year march towards the warm waters of the Mediterranean. In that time, the Russians have overrun several territories that were once Turkish, or at least once allied to the former Ottoman Empire. Turkish control and influence has been all but wiped out from southern Poland, southern Ukraine, the northern Caucasus. Entire populations have been uprooted, including the Meshketian Turks of Georgia, the Circassians of Sochi, and the Tatars of Crimea, only very few of whom have been able to return to their homeland. Be it in the name of Orthodox Christianity, Pan-Slavic nationalism, or Marxism-Leninism, the Russians have, for hundreds of years, successfully built corridors of influence that have cut through Turkish and Muslim territories in their southward advance. Before the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russian influence was at its historic peak. The Balkans, the Black Sea, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia were totally under Russian control. During the Cold War, Soviet-promoted communism was creeping into Hellenic society in both Greece and Cyprus, while Marxist-Leninist ideas fueled a number of militant groups in Turkey, including the PKK, which sought to carve out a Kurdish leftist utopia in the country's southeast. Following the coming to power of Hafez al-Assad in Syria, the Soviets secured a naval base in Tartus, which was later inherited by the Russian Federation. But when the Soviet Union fell apart, besides the Russian base in Tartus, the Russians were more or less defeated. However, the Russian withdrawal was not complete. The Russians left behind assets, puppet leaders, and open-ended conflicts that required Moscow's mediation. The Tartus naval base represented Russia's last bastion in the region, and Moscow relied on the status quo protected by Bashar al-Assad, son of Hafez, to ensure that this remained the case. But when the Syrian civil war started in 2011, Russia was alarmed, especially as the Assad regime appeared to be on the back foot throughout much of the war. When Syrian rebels took control of the Idlib province in 2015, as well as most of Syria's commercial capital Aleppo, Moscow was prompted to intervene on Assad's behalf. This created problems between Russia and Turkey, with Turkey having supported the Syrian opposition in the conflict. Russian airstrikes targeting rebels along the turkish syrian border was also creating a dispute, as Russian warplanes were on a number of occasions accused of infringing on Turkish airspace. Not only was this a problem for Turkey, but it also alarmed NATO. If attacked, Turkey, being a NATO member, could have invited a, a NATO military intervention that would potentially bring Russia and the West to direct blows. However, Turkey was not satisfied with the West's stance in the war, especially as the US opted to back the YPG militia in the Syrian conflict. Turkey has long accused the YPG of being an affiliate of the PKK. Washington's attempts to rebrand the YPG by forming the Syrian Democratic Forces failed to put Turkish concerns at ease. Judging the threat from the YPG to be more of a priority than that posed by the Assad regime, Turkey therefore entered a three-way cooperation with Russia and Iran to de-escalate the conflict in Syria, particularly in Idlib, where clashes between regime and rebel forces have since frozen, minus occasional skirmishes. But freezing the conflict in Idlib has done very little in the way of ending the conflict altogether. The rebel-held province is partially under the control of pro-Turkish militias and partially held by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which was formerly known as Nusra Front before it broke off from al-Qaeda. Although HTS does not want to engage with Turkey militarily, it is by no means pro-Turkish. Turkey is also relu reluctant to send its troops to war with HTS, considering it faces bigger threats from groups in the region that are more openly opposed to Turkey's presence, namely the YPG. Yet, 
Russia has placed on Turkey the removal of HTS forces from the M4 highway that runs between Idlib and the coastal Latakia province as a condition for continued cooperation. Instead of battling HTS directly, Turkey has been pressuring HTS to come in line. In a bid to earn Turkey's respect and secure for itself a more long-term role in Idlib, HTS has been focusing its energy on fighting Khuras al -Din which took over as Al-Qaeda's main affiliate in Syria after the Nusra Front split off and rebranded. This has suited Turkey well, as Huras ad-Din, unlike HTS, is more hostile towards Turkey and its interests. HTS, therefore, is holding off a Turkish attack by fighting Turkey's enemies. At the same time, HTS is refusing calls to disband and join the Turkish-backed Syrian National Army. Russia which is less forgiving of HTS's past, classifies the group as an unwelcome terrorist organization. And due to Turkey's lack of action against the group thus far, Russia is growing increasingly impatient. From time to time, Russia expresses its frustration in the form of airstrikes against pro-Turkish rebels in Idlib. And in February, Russian fighter jets even attacked Turkish troops in Idlib, killing dozens of them. It was a sign of more to come if the Turkish government didn't reaffirm its commitments to Russia. The incident sent Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan immediately on a flight to Moscow for emergency talks with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. It seemed Russia's heavy-handedness had worked. But eight months on, not much has changed on the ground, and Russia once again feels duped by Turkey. This time, to show its dissatisfaction, Russia has decided to suspend its joint patrols with Turkey along the M4 highway. That being said, Russia's announcement of the suspension came with a softening tone, with a promise to resume the patrols as soon as the situation on the highway calms down, referring to armed riots organized by HTS against the presence of Russian troops. There has been a considerable change in attitude from the Russian side since the last major incident in February, with the Russians putting more of an effort into, into solving disagreements diplomatically. Perhaps the difference today is that Russia's ally Bashar al-Assad appears to be on more shaky ground, with popular protests against his regime once again emerging, particularly in the Druze-majority province of Sweda. Economic woes amplified by the U.S. CISA Act sanctions, have left the regime so depleted that infighting has broken out between Assad and his business tycoon cousin, Rami Makhlouf. To add, the narrowing of the economic playing field has put Russian interest in Syria at odds with Iranian interests. Whereas Moscow and Tehran were once united by their overlapping interests to keep Assad in power before the sanctions, the two powers struggle to find any common ground today regarding who gets to exert greater control over Assad. This leaves Russia increasingly isolated in the region, with very little to show for its sacrifices five years on from its intervention in Syria. To make things worse for the Russians, Turkey is wrestling its way to a rapprochement with the West, having seemingly survived the threat of EU sanctions. Tensions in the eastern Mediterranean which escalated last year when Turkey announced a maritime demarcation deal with the UN-recognized government of Libya, had reached a near-fatal point when France sent its warships to the region to back Greece, which argued that the Turkish-Libyan deal impeded on its own unilaterally declared maximalist maritime assertions. Greece and Cyprus, backed by France, lobbied the EU internally to slap sanctions on Turkey if it did not withdraw its seismic research vessels from contested waters. With Cyprus even holding separate sanctions on Belarus hostage until the EU agreed to go along with it. The situation risked further alienating Turkey from the West and put NATO allies on the verge of war with each other. With the world poised for such an eventuality, Russia looked likely to make the most gains from the collapse of security along NATO's southeastern frontier. But following NATO and German-led mediation efforts, as well as some American posturing, Turkey and Greece agreed to de-escalate tensions and enter talks. 
If Turkey and its Western partners find a way to resolve their differences, Russia will not only wind up isolated in Syria, but could also find itself phased out of Libya as well. While Russia counts its chickens in Syria and Libya, another conflict has flared between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Over the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave, the Armenian majority breakaway region and its surroundings, which is internationally recognized as being part of Azerbaijan, has been under Armenian occupation since the early 90s. Besides occasional skirmishes, the conflict has largely been frozen ever since. But following a period of economic growth and military spending, Azerbaijan is now ready to take back the territory by force. Being a Turkic-speaking country, Azerbaijan receives huge backing from Turkey. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia has tried to play an intermediary role in the conflict between the two former Soviet republics. But as they did during the early 1900s, the Russians enjoy a greater partnership with their fellow Orthodox Christians, the Armenians. Although sympathies towards the Armenians are also prevalent in European society, especially in other Orthodox Christian countries, the reality is that European state policy generally favours Azerbaijan. That's because Azerbaijan is an oil-rich state tipped to help the EU diversify its energy reliance on Russian imports via the planned Southern Gas Corridor, which will pass through Azerbaijan, Georgia and Turkey before entering Europe. As can be seen, pipeline plans do not include Armenia, a small, landlocked and impoverished country that has very little to offer Europe geopolitically. Despite Armenia experiencing somewhat of a revolution a few years ago, similar to the popular uprisings that sent the pro-Russian government of Ukraine scurrying in 2014, the country failed to enter the Western orbit. It remains almost entirely dependent on Russia, whereas Azerbaijan has been more successful in diversifying its alliances even managing to be one of the few Muslim countries on good terms with Israel. Without Russian support, many would agree that Armenia would not even exist. So, the authorities in Yerevan are somewhat obliged to carry out Russia's dirty work when it is required of them. Russia is threatened by the Southern Gas Corridor, which is undoubtedly a competitor to Russia's monopoly over Europe's energy supplies. It was no surprise, therefore, that prior to the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh breaking out, the Armenians targeted for the first time Azerbaijan's Tovuz region, a key junction for the gas corridor, as well as other trilateral projects between Azerbaijan, Georgia and Turkey that stand to benefit Europe. By destabilizing the region, Russia aims to sabotage these projects and reassert its relevance to the European market, especially as the EU continues to push its influence eastwards in Ukraine and now in Belarus too. But Turkey, confident that the West will silently support its stance in the conflict, has not shied away from expressing its unconditional solidarity with Azerbaijan. There are even unconfirmed reports that Turkey has sent mercenaries recruited from among its allies in northern Syria to fight on Azerbaijan's behalf, and even allegations of Turkish-made drones wreaking havoc on Armenian forces. Armenia has also been accused by Turkey of using mercenaries and fighters from the PKK to boost its forces, but even if true, it seems that unless Russia gets directly involved in another conflict haphazardly, the Armenian occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh is doomed for failure. Turkish interest in the war could also see a rise in pan-Turkic nationalism in Turkey. While many former Soviet states in Central Asia maintained their neutrality after becoming independent, Turkey naturally emerged as a player in the Turkic states of Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. There are still Turkic and Muslim populations in Russia where Turkish influence can be found, such as Tatarstan and Bashkortostan. Turkey also yields influence in the troubled, oil-rich Muslim republics of the Northern Caucasus, 
including Chechnya, Dagestan and Ingushetia. Likewise, Turkey has Turkic and Muslim allies in former Soviet and Eastern Bloc states, such as the Bosnians in the Balkans, the Crimean Tatars in Ukraine, the Gagauls in Moldova, and the Turks of Bulgaria, Romania and Macedonia. Any one of these allies could be activated to challenge Russian interests at any time. Unlike Turkey's support for the Muslim Brotherhood and its affiliates in the MENA region, Turkey's support for these populations is not based on the personality of the Turkish president. Turkey's sense of affinity with these populations come from a shared 2,000-year history, as well as a long-term strategic goal to keep the Russians at bay. While Turkey's involvement in Arab countries, especially those that were former Ottoman territories, steps on the toes of modern-day Western hegemony, the West does not consider Turkish expansionism as a threat where it plays a useful role in weakening the Russians. The Turkish-Western alliance was born in the mid-1800s based on this understanding and was reaffirmed upon this shared vision during the formation of NATO in the transition period between World War II and the Cold War. It is therefore likely that if the EU and Turkey can come to a fair power-sharing agreement in the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey may agree to back down on certain red lines in its dispute with Greece for more Western backing in the anticipated escalations between Turkey and Russia elsewhere, be that in the ongoing conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, or future proxy wars in other regions where Turkish and Russian interests clash, or for that matter, where Turkish and Western interests overlap. Perhaps Turkey's recent announcement of its discovery of natural gas in the Black Sea is an indication that Ankara is ready to shift its focus to the north if it is offered a satisfactory deal to itself. That will largely depend on Greece, which despite being in Europe in body, has more often than not proved to have its heart in Russia. But of course, that's another story for another time. The Republic of Cyprus may be tiny in size, but it certainly punches above its weight. The island's internationally recognized Greek Cypriot government proved that in September by almost taking the European Union's foreign policy hostage. The bloc needed all 27 member states to approve economic sanctions on Belarus, but Nicosia refused to give its approval until EU leaders could promise to implement similar sanctions on Turkey if it did not withdraw its seismic vessels from a disputed maritime area claimed by Cyprus. Nicosia's stance irked much criticism from its EU partners a number of whom argued that sanctions on Belarus and Turkey were two separate issues that should be independent of each other. By insisting on its stance, Cyprus was taking a tremendous risk, as there was no united resolve among EU countries on how to deal with Turkey. Considering that Ankara holds more intrinsic leverage in the realm of geopolitics, it is understandable that given the choice, some EU countries would rather upset Nicosia than risk waking up the sleeping giant that is Turkey. In the past, Turkey has shown what it is capable of achieving in Europe, as hundreds of thousands of refugees from conflict zones in the Middle East and Central Asia travelled through its territory to overwhelm the EU's asylum system. The tidal wave of migrants brought EU states to loggerheads as borders went up and poorer Mediterranean countries, like Greece, were left to bear the brunt of the crisis, with very little support from their allies. Today, refugees on a number of Greek islands in the Aegean outnumber locals, while Greek police reinforcements from the mainland deal not only with rioting migrants who complain of inhumane conditions in their squalid, overcrowded camps, but also Greek islanders who accuse Athens of breaking its promise to spread the new arrivals out across the country and using their homeland as a dumping ground. Perhaps that is why even Greece, Cyprus's closest ally, stayed surprisingly mum on Nicosia's approach to the dilemma as other EU nations started pondering whether or not to push through with the sanctions on Belarus 
regardless of Cypriot objections. Greece, buoyed by French support, verbally backed EU sanctions on Turkey, but did not mention anything about linking these sanctions to Belarus. However, just ahead of the much-anticipated EU summit in which these two issues would be tackled, Greece and Turkey announced that they had agreed to revive talks regarding their maritime dispute in the eastern Mediterranean. Turkey's seismic vessels were abruptly recalled from the waters of the Greek islands of Crete and Castorizo, and Cyprus was left alone to face what could have winded up becoming a major embarrassment. Nonetheless, President Nikos Anastasiadis's administration was spared its blushes when the EU issued a strong statement in support of Cyprus, threatening sanctions on Turkey if it didn't withdraw its ships from around the island. Shortly afterwards, Turkey did just that, and the EU was able to pass the Belarus sanctions smoothly. Regardless, Cyprus proved its point. It proved that it was not an EU member to be overlooked simply because of its small size. It also proved to Turkey that it had the ability to rally powerful allies who could collectively match, if not surpass, Turkey's sway in the geopolitical arena. But that may have come at a cost. There has generally been a distrust towards Cyprus from other EU members since it was accepted into the bloc in 2004. Senior officials in Europe have even gone as far as expressing regret over the decision to grant Cyprus membership to the EU owing to the still unresolved Cyprus problem. Cyprus is the only state in the EU that does not exert full control over its entire claimed territory. The northern part of the island is host to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, a breakaway state of Turkish Cypriots who declared independence from the Republic of Cyprus in 1983, nine years after a Turkish military intervention split the island the TRNC is not recognised internationally and is considered by Greek Cypriot authorities in the island south to be a Turkish occupation of its territory. The EU shares the same position, although the situation in Cyprus predates the island's accession to the bloc. There was a last gasp attempt to resolve the frozen conflict in Cyprus before its EU accession by holding parallel referendums on both sides of the island that could have resulted in it being reunified. A positive result would have led to Turkish troops pulling out of Cyprus, with the possibility of the door for Turkey to also join the EU being opened. With Turkey's encouragement, the Turkish Cypriots largely voted in favour of reunification, but the Greek Cypriots voted down the plan, which was spearheaded by then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Despite the outcome, a divided Republic of Cyprus joined the EU as a full and equal member, veto rights and all. The Turkish Cypriots, meanwhile, despite being recognised as citizens of the Republic of Cyprus and therefore EU citizens, were left with no real representation in Brussels and therefore no way to voice their worries in the European Parliament. While the EU does not recognise the TRNC, it does, with Turkish Cypriot permission and Greek Cypriot blessing, fund and manage restoration projects in the Turkish-controlled north. The EU also leads on cultural peace initiatives, often based in the UN-controlled buffer zone that runs along the ceasefire line, to help bring Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots together. The EU is therefore able to act as a peacemaker on a local, grassroots level between the island's divided communities. But as a direct result of it accepting the Republic of Cyprus as a member state while its government remains devoid of Turkish Cypriot representation, the EU is not able to play the role of an impartial arbitrator on an international level. Due to Nicosia's veto, the EU likewise cannot make progress on Turkey's accession process to the bloc. This means that instead of delivering a batch of blue flags to be flown as far as the borders of Syria, Iraq and Iran, the EU has been dragged into a dispute with Turkey, home to the second largest army in NATO, along its ever more exposed southeastern frontier. There are also concerns within the EU over Cyprus's commitment to the bloc's values. Nicosia has been under fire for its so-called Golden Visa Scheme, which allows mega-investors to become citizens. The scheme has allowed shady oligarchs from Russia and China 
some of whom are suspected of involvement in organized crime, to enter and exploit the EU via Cyprus. Anastasiades' government, as well as previous Greek Cypriot governments, have long had a soft spot for Russia. The island has become a second home for many Russian expatriates, many of whom have settled around the port city of Limassol, which has appropriately been dubbed Limassolgrad. Cyprus also serves as an offshore haven for huge amounts of Russian money. This perhaps explains why Cyprus consistently flouts EU rules and norms when dealing with Moscow. The Limassol port regularly hosts Russian warships who use it as a pit stop in the Mediterranean. In the past, Cyprus even allowed Russian arms shipments destined for Syria to depart from the port in spite of EU embargoes. Previous EU-led attempts to curb Russian influence in Cyprus has had very little impact. In 2013, when Cyprus was on the verge of bankruptcy amid the Eurozone economic crisis, Nicosia was only able to secure a 10 billion euro bailout by agreeing to place a levy of 6.75% on bank deposits of over 100,000 euros. Russian investors in Cyprus were most hard hit by the levy. The EU hoped that by shaking Russian confidence in Cypriot banks, they'd ultimately abandon Cyprus, consequently setting the island up for greater economic integration into Europe. Having recovered from the crisis, however, Cyprus continues to encourage Russian investment, and its dependence on Russian money is increasingly showing in its foreign policy. Unlike Turkey and Greece, Cyprus is not a NATO member. Until last year, Cyprus itself was subject to a US arms embargo, which Washington decided to lift on the condition that it no longer offers its facilities to the Russians. Anastasiades rejected this condition, and even when US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced in his recent visit to the island the partial lifting of these embargoes as an incentive to help get the Greek Cypriots more on board, Anastasiades' government remained aloof on the subject. In fact, many commentators have noted that Nicosia's demands on Turkey to unlock the sanctions on Belarus came after Russia's foreign minister Sergei Lavrov visited Cyprus at the beginning of September to mark 60 years of Russian Cypriot ties. Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, who is often referred to as Europe's last dictator, is a strong Russian ally who has been infamous for keeping his country's pro-European opposition out of power. Fearing a repeat of what happened in Ukraine in 2014, when demonstrators forced the country's pro-Russian president to flee Kiev, Russia is eager to keep Lukashenko in power. It would therefore be no surprise if Russia seeks to court Cyprus to act as a mole within the EU in order to derail sanctions on their ally in Minsk. With Nicosia so heavily reliant on Russian money, it is hardly in a position to turn down such requests. The delegation from Nicosia may have made their mark in Brussels, but it would certainly be unwise of the Greek Cypriots to allow their success to get to their heads and lead them to overestimate their importance. Cyprus remains the EU's black sheep, and its behaviour has many of its European allies suspicious of its intentions. Thus far, the only interest the Greek Cypriots have shown in regards to being part of the EU community is in gaining extra leverage against Turkey. Occasionally, it is able to cherry-pick individual member states, like France, to help create an anti-Turkish front when their national interests overlap. Yet, from time to time, Cyprus demands more than the EU could possibly deliver with even its closest ally Greece having to put stops on their relationship. When the EU can't deliver, Nicosia rarely hesitates to seek that leverage from elsewhere, even if that means cooperating with non-EU states against the EU's interests. Another test for Cyprus will be in the conflict that has just broken out between Azerbaijan and Armenia. The Greek Cypriots are largely Orthodox Christians, just like the Armenians, and together, they share a similar hatred towards Turkey. Greek Cypriots and the Armenians are therefore natural allies, while Azerbaijan is a Turkish ally. Cyprus is also home to a large Armenian diaspora. 
although nowhere near as large as the Turkish Cypriot population. Meanwhile, Russia, another nation largely composed of Orthodox Christians, is also a key Armenian ally. Yet, although sympathies towards the Armenians are prevalent throughout European societies, it is more than likely that Russia is using Armenia to destabilize the region close to a junction through which an important gas pipeline is expected to pass. The pipeline, running through Azerbaijan, Georgia and Turkey, and bypassing Armenia before reaching Europe, aims to help the EU diversify its gas imports away from Russia. While most EU states will call for calm, if the war between the Armenians and the Azeris becomes a matter of supporting either one or the other, European nations that are more averse to Russia than they are to Turkey will be secretly rooting for the Azeris. In this instance, the Greek Cypriots may have to resist their more base instincts that incline them to support the Armenians and accept that being part of the EU means putting aside oneself for the greater good of the family, even if that equates to bowing down to Turkey's supremacy. If the EU was almost prepared to disregard Cyprus's veto for the sake of implementing sanctions on Belarus, one can only imagine where Cyprus would be left on even more pressing issues. September has seen the first major anti-government protest to erupt in Egypt since Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was elected president in 2014, a year after he led a military coup against his presidential predecessor, the late Mohamed Morsi. Morsi, who hailed from the Muslim Brotherhood, a banned organisation that originated in Egypt in the 1920s and has since gone global, was ousted by Sisi after just one year in power following mass demonstrations against his rule. He himself had only come to be in charge after former strongman leader Hosni Mubarak was forced to step down amid the Arab Spring Revolution that kicked off in 2010. A decade ago, in the midst of the revolution that not only swept Egypt but also the Middle East and North Africa, one could be forgiven for believing that the Arab world was on the verge of being acquainted with a democratic transition that was to include all walks of life from society, including the hugely influential political Islamists of the Muslim Brotherhood, otherwise known as Ikhwanis. Optimists saw the overthrowing of dictatorship regimes and military leaders as an overdue Arab declaration of independence from a political status quo that had been set up to appease the post-colonial world of Western hegemony. For too long had the majority Sunni Muslim populations, who on the whole hold relatively conservative values, suffered silently at the hands of secular leaders, who punished any demonstration of Islamic principles that were not endorsed by the state. This meant tough limits and controls on expressions of religious solidarity with the global Ummah, or Muslim community, as well as the suppression of theological objections to state policies. The secularists and Ikhwanis were already on a collision course before the end of the colonial era. After the Ottoman Empire was carved up by Western imperialist nations, namely Britain, France and Italy, a difference of opinion arose regarding the future direction of the Muslim world. Some aspired to follow the footsteps of the West by establishing secular nation-states. Others sought to revive the so-called Golden Age of Islam, continuing on the trajectory put in motion by the Prophet Muhammad and his companions in the 7th century. It was, however, the former camp that gained the most momentum, while the latter became so irrelevant to political discourse that the main debate in society became one of secular monarchists versus secular republicans. Yet, as the Ikhwanis became more and more estranged, their attention-seeking methods became more and more radical. In Egypt, it was the republicans who gained the upper hand when secular nationalist leader Gamal Abdel Nasser replaced the Egyptian monarchy in 1952. With the monarchy out of the way and the Nasserists firmly in power, the Ikhwanis by de facto took the place of the main opposition.
thereafter ensued a surreal phase in which the Brotherhood, which was at the time advocating for an Islamic theocracy, had no choice but to play along according to the rules of a system they are intrinsically opposed to, which by its very design gave their secular opponents the advantage from the onset. The Ikhwanis, empowered by their loyalty to the traditional Islamic system that governed the Muslim world for over a millennium, felt an overwhelming sense of entitlement and legitimacy over their counterparts, who they viewed as impostors and puppets of foreign and most importantly non-Muslim imperialist powers. Until the Yom Kippur War with Israel in 1973, however, there was some overlap between these two camps. They were both united in their opposition to Israel and their sense of affinity with the Palestinian cause. Nonetheless, Egypt's defeat in the war meant that in 1978, Nasser's successor Anwar Sadat had to agree to the Camp David Accords, amounting to Cairo's official recognition and establishment of diplomatic ties with Israel. Neither the secular nationalists nor the Ikhwanis were particularly happy with this outcome. But the Egyptian government bit the bullet and hesitantly embraced the new cold peace in the region. For the Ikhwanis, however, the attitude of the secular regime was even more proof of their treacherous intent towards the Muslim world, and more of a reason to continue fighting them until they were removed. In 1981, President Sadat was gunned down during a ceremony marking the end of the aforementioned war. The attack was blamed on the Brotherhood, which thereafter came under an ever more fierce crackdown. The assassination of Sadat sent a message to all post-colonial leaders in the Muslim world, from the Arab monarchies and sheikhdoms of the Gulf to the socialist nationalist Ba'athist regimes of Syria and Iraq. Even the Palestinian Liberation Organization was reminded that besides resisting the Israeli occupation of Palestine, it also had to keep an eye on the Brotherhood and its affiliates. They all had a legitimate reason to fear the Ikhwanis, primarily due to the movement's propagation of Tawheed al hakimiyah or Oneness of God's Rule, which states that any leader who rules according to a law other than that of God's Sharia is not a believer, and thus provides Muslims with the mandate to forcibly remove any leader who implements a legal system that contradicts the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. This belief was promoted by prominent Brotherhood member Sayyid Qutb, and to this day also fuels the ideology of other breakaway groups and offshoots such as Hamas and Hizbut Tahrir. These groups are also often referred to by more secular Arabs as Hizbis, which points to their blurring of lines between religious and political thought. Meanwhile, Madkhali Salafists, who dominate the religious scene in Saudi Arabia, often refer to these groups as being Takfiri or even Khawarij, meaning they accuse other Muslims of being non-believers to usurp power from them thus resulting in they themselves abandoning the fold of orthodox Islam. For decades, the Muslim Brotherhood faced constant suppression at the hands of authoritarian leaders across the Arab and Muslim world, despite the movement's popularity among the disenfranchised masses. However, in the year 2010, when the Arab Spring Revolution started, the Ikhwanis were presented with a golden opportunity to reinvent themselves and proved that they were ready to play ball. By that point, the Brotherhood already had a successful template to follow in the example of Turkish leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who himself hailed from a movement called Milli Gurush, which shares many similarities with the Brotherhood. Erdogan's Justice and Development Party was by all means at the time a modern, democratic and secular political party that had done wonders for the Turkish economy, all the while catering for the needs of a conservative Muslim society. It was something the Ikhwanis could aspire to and emulate, not just in Egypt, but also in Tunisia and Libya, where they were poised to make gains after the downfall of their respective dictatorships. But where the Brotherhood went wrong in Egypt 
was in their failure to imitate Erdogan's domestic and foreign balancing act. Almost as soon as Mohamed Morsi was elected president in 2013, Erdogan was invited to Cairo, where he was welcomed like some kind of Ottoman sultan. Not only did this antagonize Morsi's domestic opposition, namely the secular nationalists who are paranoid about Egypt once again coming under Turkish control, it also left Israel feeling very exposed. Suddenly, the two most powerful Sunni Muslim nations in the region, with a combined population of 190 million, were joining forces. Morsi immediately opened Egypt's border with Gaza, allowing weapons to reach Hamas militants through Sinai. He also allowed Iranian ships to pass through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean, further irking Israel, as well as Iran's bitter rival Saudi Arabia. His behaviour did very little to reassure the concerns of other stakeholders in the region, and thus his ouster a year later came as no surprise. Shortly after Sisi took charge, a crackdown began against Morsi's supporters, and the Muslim Brotherhood was forced back into the shadows. Egypt's relationship with Israel was reaffirmed, and the border with Gaza was closed once again, with Hamas being cast aside as troublemakers. The entire senior leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood was put behind bars, while the movement's social networks were dispersed, with some fleeing abroad and others going into hiding. Even the acting head of the movement, Mahmoud Azat, was caught by Egyptian security forces in August after being on the run for seven years. Needless to say, however, the Brotherhood is a global organisation, so it is almost impossible to wipe it out completely. Nonetheless, Egypt, being the birthplace of the Brotherhood and home to around a quarter of the world's Arab population, has always been the ideological heartland of the movement, as well as its central command base. Without its core, the movement is at risk of fragmenting. In fact, one could argue that this fragmentation has already started. With all avenues to political inclusion more or less blocked, some of the more moderate voices within the Brotherhood have been silenced. To be fair, it took many decades for the Brotherhood to take its place in the democratic process. On one hand, there was a reluctance from within the movement to become a participant in what it deemed to be a foreign-imposed un-Islamic system. On the other hand, the system was for a long time controlled by regimes that did not want to see the Brotherhood become a participant. Yet, when the opportunity presented itself following the Arab Spring, the Brotherhood rose to the occasion and came out on top. Then, just as had happened in Algeria in 1991, the political Islamists saw their democratically gained victory stolen from them. This only worked to embolden the more hardline Ikhwanis, who, without a healthy outlet to express their grievances, were more likely to turn to militancy and extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. The ongoing Islamist insurgency that broke out in the Sinai Peninsula after Mursi's ouster is a testament to this. The Brotherhood also faces a split at the other end of the spectrum. Younger Egyptians who are sympathetic to the movement are beginning to grow disillusioned with its leadership. Their political tactics and revolutionary rhetoric have become archaic and obsolete, yielding little to nothing in the way of results. When the Brotherhood was first established in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna, it was creating jobs, building hospitals, and providing education and training for young people. Today, however, the Brotherhood is struggling to address the everyday needs of young Egyptians who face widespread unemployment and poverty. The youth are in need of a much more pragmatic and results-orientated approach, and the promise of an Islamist government that will come along, wave a magic wand and somehow make everything better no longer resonates as much as it used to. The urbanised Egyptian youth of today are much more educated than their rural parents and grandparents, and they are therefore less gullible to the populist methods that worked so well for the Brotherhood in earlier days. Young, religiously inclined Egyptians are seeking new ways to express themselves and participate in a post-Brotherhood society to bring about contemporary solutions to contemporary problems. 
Without a well-grounded generation to take over from the movement's ageing and out-of-touch senior leaders, the Brotherhood is at risk of fizzling out altogether within the next 10 years. That being said, the Muslim Brotherhood and its affiliates still uphold some of their old relevance today, mainly outside of Egypt. Libya is a perfect example. Perhaps in a bid to avoid a repeat of the bloodshed and instability that occurred in Egypt, the international community has sought to spearhead a more inclusive initiative in Libya by helping Libyans form a temporary transitional government that includes politicians from Ikhwani backgrounds. This didn't quite go according to plan, as this government was considered by many Libyans to be foreign imposed. Renegade Commander Khalifa Haftar, a one-time loyalist of former strongman leader Muammar Gaddafi, was also opposed to the Ikhwani elements in the Government of National Court, claiming that it included terrorists. Having launched a massive offensive to bring down the government in Tripoli on behalf of Libya's eastern-based rival government in Tobruk, Haftar irked the response of Turkey, which sent its troops to Tripoli to defend the besieged government there. As a result, Haftar's offensive fell flat, and peace negotiations to end the conflict began. Like this, the Muslim Brotherhood secured for itself a platform to stand on and a voice within the Libyan democratic process, largely thanks to Turkey's backing. Under Erdogan's leadership, Turkey has been supporting Ikhwani groups across the Muslim world. Just as Ankara supported Morsi's presidency in Egypt, it also condemned the coup that deposed him, and has had poor relations with Egypt ever since. Turkey is also fond of Tunisian politician and founder of the Islamist and Nahda party, Rashid al ghanoushi Likewise, Islamist groups in Syria, some of whom may have connections with the Muslim Brotherhood, also enjoy Turkey's support. In Gaza, Muslim Brotherhood offshoot Hamas is on the receiving end of much spiritual and diplomatic support from Turkey, while in Sudan, former leader Omar al-Bashir, who was sympathetic to the Brotherhood, was also a Turkish ally before he was ousted last year. Yet those opposed to the Ikhwanis also have their backers, namely Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Riyadh and Abu Dhabi have supported Sisi's presidency in Egypt. They also send financial and military support to Haftar in Libya, as well as the new post-Bashir authorities in Sudan. When it comes to Syria, the UAE has re-established its ties with the Assad regime in a move seemingly aimed at establishing a front against Turkey's growing influence there. The UAE has also established ties with Israel, thus opening the door for other Muslim countries to do the same, such as Bahrain, Chad and Kosovo. This development has somewhat taken the steam out of Hamas, which has long prided itself on being a form of Islamic resistance against Israel. Hamas will find itself completely undermined if Muslim countries continue to establish ties with Israel, which would in turn affect Turkey's standing too. Another issue is that Ikhwani groups cannot depend on Turkey's backing alone. Turkey may pack a good punch, as it did when defending Tripoli from Haftar's forces, but in the long term, it lacks the political and economic stability to be counted on as a reliable partner. Turkey was not able to save Morsi in 2013, the same way it was unable to save Bashir in 2019. Turkey's intervention may have granted the UN-recognized Libyan government a lifeline, but it could not prevent Prime Minister Fayez al-Saraj's resignation in the face of mass protests nor has it been able to exert enough influence to maintain its position as the main broker in reconciliation processes. Similarly, Turkey's allies in Tunisia have been forced to give major concessions in power-sharing agreements with their political rivals, and, as Hamas backs down from its more hardline demands against Israel and its Palestinian rivals Fatah to secure its own relevance to the regional developments, Turkey may find its hand weakened in Gaza as well. To top it all off, Turkey's support for Ikhwani groups is seemingly based on the personality of President Erdogan rather than long-term state policy. 
but with a wide range of domestic issues bringing down Erdogan's popularity, there is no guarantee he will be in power beyond the next election, or if his would-be successors will continue down his path. Therefore, if the Ikhwanis are to survive, they may need to abandon the former tactics of the Muslim Brotherhood, if not abandon the organisation altogether. The revolutionary rhetoric of the movement's senior leadership has expired. Their progress over the decades has run out of fuel and come to a steady halt. The time is nigh for the younger generation of Ikhwanis to take charge and start participating in the democratic process as partners rather than ideological adversaries and work together with their fellow countrymen to overcome the modern-day challenges that they all face. As the latest demonstrations against Sisi have shown, there is still a huge feeling of discontent among the masses, who 10 years from the Arab Spring still express the same grievances. This time, instead of exploiting that public energy to make selfish gains at the expense of non-partisan issues, the Ikhwanis need to nurture it and be prepared to give concessions to regain their place at the table. Without a strong, charismatic and outspoken challenger to Sisi's one-man monopoly over the country, the Ikhwanis of Egypt may not be ready to implement Erdogan's Turkish model of political Islam, but the Ghanoushi's Tunisian model might just work.